But I want to begin by talking a little bit about the future. Remember we're talking about going into a new year, into a new opportunity, and we have to learn about the future, how to understand the future. And one of the first things we talked about is the fact that the future of all creation is hidden in that created thing. Very important principle to remember because that is the heart of confidence. We're talking about how to face this year with confidence and to face every year with confidence, not to be afraid. If you read the stock market reports, if you read the global unrest problems, and if you read the nuclear arms discussions, and if you read about the uncertainty of economic stability, and if you read about the industrial strikes and so forth, you begin to think, uh, am I going to be able to have a safe life? Uh, if my country downs, and my company rather downsizes, will I be one that they lay off? If something happens to our economy, will I be able to pay my mortgage? I mean, there's just so much uncertainty. And yet, the Holy Spirit is saying to us in this message that there's no need for my people to worry about anything in the world. I mean nothing in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I am speaking to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no need for you to worry about 2004. No need to worry about it. And the reason is because of this first statement. The future of everything is created in the thing. And therefore, it's important to understand how the future works. Number two, the future was existed before the present. We live in the present, but our future is actually pre-existing. Whatever you are going to is behind God. Now that gives you peace and it gives you total confidence. No matter how it looks, it may look difficult right now, but don't worry. No wonder why the words of Jesus Christ were always, do not be afraid. Do not worry. Be of good cheer. Why? He said, because I have already overcome this world. The future, number three, is unmanifested purpose. Remember that purpose is what you were born to become, what you were created to do, and your future is simply that unmanifested. Number four, the future of a product is the manufacturer's past. I said this in the last session, but I don't think that you even capture the spirit of this thing. It is so deep to me. The future of a product is the manufacturer's past. Say that with me. The future of a product is the manufacturer's past. I want you to think about that. It sounds a little confusing, but it's probably the most important revelation concerning confidence. When a manufacturer makes a product, he always finishes it first. Then he makes it. <laughs> Matter of fact, you cannot really build a house in the Bahamas until it's finished. The government will not allow you to start a house that is not finished. And they make it a requirement that you finish it first. They want to see the land, they want to see the complete design, they want to see the architectural renderings, they want to see the plumbing, they want to see the electrical works, they want to see how it's manicured, they want to see the steel structure, they want to see a finished house, they want to even see the visual. Then they stamp and say, approved. Now you can begin. In other words, the future of that house is the builder's past. And that is why God says, 
He chose you in him before the world was created. God is not experimenting with your life in this year. God's excited about what he already knows you are about to experience that he's already completed. <laughs> so the Bible says simple words like all things work together all things for your good for my good some of the things you're going through don't feel good don't look good it ain't acting good it is not a good experience God said don't worry about it it's already finished this is a setup we fail when we believe that the president the, sorry that the present is our future let me say it again we fail when we believe that the present is our future whatever you're going through is not your future the manufacturer has already finished the product and therefore number five is important the future is unreleased destiny what you were born to become is already finished it's your destination and so your future is your destiny unreleased yet number six the future is your predestination number seven the future is God's past this has helped me through the years. I, 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 I've gone through a lot of interesting experiences in my life. And one of the things that have kept me as a young man, and even to this day, I live by this, is this understanding that my future is God's past. Nothing that I go through surprises God. Nothing. And number seven, number eight rather, the future is the end that is trapped in the beginning all of these are important to understand your peace I don't know who's gonna die in 2004 I have no idea and some of you it may be your time this year I don't know that do you know how I live I live in a strange way. I don't know if I should even say this but because I, I, I think differently from most people, but I think I prepare myself mentally and emotionally and spiritually for the worst. And once I am settled that I can handle the worst, life is easy. For example, I've already settled in my mind that if my son or daughter dies, how will I live without my children? That's the worst that can happen to my kids, for them to die. And a lot of young people have been killed. How would I live without my son if he died in an accident in school this year? Not that he will, but what, 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 how would I live? How would I relax, react? Would I lose my ministry? Would I go hide as a hermit in the mountains and forget about this and curse God? I, I, I've already lived without my wife in my mind I said what would happen if my wife died some of you never think that way would I fall apart and lose everything would I lose my mind what would life be without my wife Ruth that's the worst thing that can ever happen to me in other words if you can settle the worst the devil is beat Jesus lived that way. He told his disciples in his first meeting, he says, I'm going to be killed. He gave them the worst scenario first. He said, I'm coming and I'm going to die. Now let's get on with life. If you lose your house this year, that's possible. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But how would, what would you do if they repossess your house? Would you lose your faith in God? 
Would you throw aside your confidence and not believe? Or, or would you understand from the teaching that you know something? Uh, God knew that was going to happen. Why? Because my future is his past. In other words, losing a house is just a passing moment in my beautiful future. And God would allow me to lose one to get a better one. And sometimes we hang on to the one real tight and God say, no, that's not the final one. And because you won't let it go, I'll take it from you to get you to the big one. All things work together for your good. It's his past. Write this down, please. The future in the present. First principle I want to emphasize is that your future is not ahead of you, but it's trapped within you. And number two, you possess your future not later, but now. Every day, a portion of your future is supposed to be released. Every week, there's supposed to be a week worth of future released. Every month, is supposed to be a month worth of your future exposed. Every year, there was supposed to be a year's worth of your future manifested. And that's why God gave us days and weeks and years so that we can release our future in doses. Number three, very important. God is committed to the future he has placed in your present. Set up with me, please. God is committed to my future that he placed in my present. In other words, God has put something in you that he wants to be manifested in this earth. And God is committed to that investment, that deposit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the key to this confidence again. God is committed to what he put in you. God is committed to what he placed in you. God is committed to what he placed in you. God is committed to what he placed in you. God, God himself is committed to what he put in you. I'm not a smart man. I just know God a little bit. And people think you're smart when you know God. And what I know about God is, He is committed to what He placed in you. God doesn't just give you a future. He has committed Himself to make sure it becomes your past. missed it you missed it I'm gonna say one more time God is committed to your future that he put in you and he will be so committed until it becomes your past it's already his past but he's committed to your future in other words God has rallied all resources all assistance all demons and all angels Every, even the devil. He has everybody working to make sure your future comes to pass. Oh, you don't get it. God is committed. That means when you ain't got nothing, don't worry. He's still committed to it. And he's going to bring what you need, when you need, how you need it, where you need it, anytime you want it. He can have it there. God, God is more committed to your success than you are. That's your confidence. How am I going to see the establishment of a $21 million facility down here on Kamaika Road that will teach 600 leaders every two years and send them to the world? I don't know, but God is committed to that future.
And that means that all the facilities, all the resources, all the instructors, all the furniture, all the equipment, all technology, that's his problem. He's going to make sure it gets to the Bahamas, built on Carmichael Road, and there will be students in those classrooms because God is committed to his future he put in my present. God is committed to the future he put in you. Why am I stuck here? Listen, you believe, and you see, I, God doesn't want you to go into this year thinking that you're going to finance his dream with your mingly salary. God gave you your salary to give offerings and tithes, that's all. But you can't do nothing else with it. He is committed to the rest of the stuff by himself. You know what you got ain't enough. Lift your hands and say, Lord, do your thing. See, if you try to do it your way, you ain't going to make it. But he's committed to what he put in you. If God showed you a vision, you told God, I want a new house in 2004. Because I want to house some people who don't have houses. Or I'd like to keep some of the guests who are coming to the conferences. Or I'd like to keep some of these young people who are kicked out and have a problem. I, listen to me. God, if he gave you that vision for that house, you know your salary can't build that house. Matter of fact, it can't keep the one you got now. But if God gave you that, believe me friends, God is committed to it. And he will bring the resources and all you need from places you never imagined. And in one year, you'll be cutting a ribbon. God is committed. I say God is committed. Write this down, please. Your future is more important than your past. Very simple statement, but difficult to accept. It doesn't matter how horrible your past is. Don't you ever live there. Very important. Number five, your future is more valuable than your past. Not only is it more important, it's more valuable. <laughs> you thought you did some things that were wonderful. Stop boasting of a past that cannot compare to your future. Okay, so you got a high school diploma. So what? That's your past. Go on and get your BA. Okay, so you got your BA. Uh-huh. Go on and get your master's. Oh, you got three of them. Fine. Now forget your master's and go on and get your PhD. Oh, you got your PhD. Mm-hmm. Now go on and build a school to create more students. You own the school next time. See, God always has a future better and more valuable than your past. That's why your failures can never destroy your success. You and I have failed in many things, but that's history. Write this down, please. Very important. Your future is more powerful than your past. Do you know why? Because you can control your future. You cannot do a thing with your past. So your future is more powerful. Matter of fact, the only power that your past has is what you give it. And that is why Jesus came to forgive your past. But he also came to salvage your future. Jesus knows that he nor you can do anything about your past. But he also knows that he and you can do something about your future. So what he does is he forgives your past, cleanses it, wipes out the consciousness of it, takes away the guilt of your past. And then he gives you a clean sheet of life. 
and said, now let's create a new history that will be a pleasure to remember. You are not free until your past has no effect on your future. You are not free until you can talk about your past and smile. You are not free until you are not afraid if people find out about your past. As long as you are hiding it, afraid of it, guilt-ridden because of it, you are not free yet. Matter of fact, the reason why you ain't going to your future is because the baggage is too heavy. Jesus forgives your past. Lift your hand up right now and say, Lord, I receive your forgiveness of every dumb decision that I made in my life. And there are many I haven't made yet. They're the ones that will make a difference. He's a forgiving God. It's a very important scripture, Psalm 57. It says, I cried out to God, who is most high. God who fulfills his purpose for me. I'm stuck on this verse for the rest of my life. Read the verse carefully. It says, <laughs> I cry unto God. This is David speaking. David went through a lot of stress, problems. He said, I cried unto God, who is most high. He will fulfill his purpose for me. I told you, God is committed to the future he put in you. Now it says, he will fulfill it. And he calls it his. <laughs> oh, I tell you. Can I suggest something that you stop saying? Stop saying this statement. My life. Because as long as it's your life, You have to fulfill it. Read the verse out loud. I cry out to God. Come on, everybody. Most high to God who fulfills his purpose for me. <laughs> Say like the Apostle Paul who finally figured it out. Paul says... It is not I that lives. See, he transferred the responsibility for the fulfillment of his life from himself to the manufacturer. He said, look, it is not I that live it, but it is Christ that liveth within me. And the life I now live, I live by the grace. Grace means what? Enablement giftings of God the Father. In other words, this year should not be your year. This should be God's year. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? That's why ain't nothing going to happen to you if it's his purpose, he fulfill it in your life that he himself does not allow. I believe there are a lot of things we lead ourselves into. Because God didn't want us to go into those areas. But we were living our own life. I cry unto the Lord. I wonder what David cried. He didn't say what he cried. He said why he cried. He said, I cried to the Lord because he will fulfill his purpose for me. Now, I wonder what he cried. I believe David cried, help. Why? What I'm doing ain't working. I try and everything, it ain't working, help. God said, thank you very much for my life back. Amen. Amen. A 
few of y'all getting it. I'm telling you, matter of fact, do it right now. Say, Lord, on the first Sunday, the first day of the week, take your life back. Lift your hands and let him take it right now in Jesus' name. Come on. Give him his life back. Give him his year back. Say, Lord, this one is yours. Oh, he's taking over right now. He's taking over management of your life again. And believe me, he's a good manager. You just gave him responsibility for everything that happens in this year. This book says, verse 3, He sends forth from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who haughtily pursue me. Same passage. David says that's his life. That's his purpose, and he's going to fix everybody who fool with that. Y'all don't get it. That verse is powerful. He said, look, if it's his, then relax yourself. Matter of fact, God wants you to live like you are in Disney World this year. Let me explain what I mean. When I took my kids to Disney World some years ago in Orlando, Florida, I'll never forget they wanted to go on this roller coaster ride, Space Mountain. And they're little kids, they don't know any better. <laughs> and they're excited, and I'm scared. And my wife and I strapped ourselves in, the guy put us in, he said, now put the, the, the seat belt on, and they locked this thing down. <coughs> locked. I said, I feel helpless. He said, that's the way you're supposed to feel. No, y'all missed it. He's about to take me on a dangerous ride, and he said, I want you to feel helpless. You need to get the revelation. As long as you there helping, 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 God said, I can't take you on this ride. <laughs> Come on, somebody. He, the guy said, look, you're supposed to feel helpless. Why? We control everything. You got to praise God. <laughs> God wants you, Kona Musa, in the first week of the year to strap yourself in. Put the word all around your waist. Have your loins girded. And let him shove the Holy Ghost control down. <laughs> and say, God, uh, helpless. And let the Lord take you on a roller coaster ride for 2004. And believe me, friends, oh, but Derek, sometime during the ride, we came to the top. Woo! Mountain top. When the five minutes later, whoa! Down in a dark. Ah! And some of you all this year are going to go through a dark dungeon. All you got to do is just what? Stay helpless. Just enjoy the ride. Hallelujah. Why? It's only for a moment that he will allow you to go through a dark tunnel? It says that he sends from heaven. Lord have mercy. He even ain't sending from your boss or your paycheck or your business. He can bring this stuff from a place that you can't even get to. Lord have mercy. He's going to send from heaven everything you need. And then those who have plans for you this year to hinder you and to stop you and to try and confuse you and try to deter you, he already told you he got plans for them. You ought to praise him. Hey! So when you see somebody, when you go to work for this first week and they begin to act a little bit un reasonable just smile and say you don't want to do that to me it says he will save me from them save with me I mean, I'm I'm gonna enjoy the ride now say it like you believe it in your spirit Tell your neighbor, enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> I just feel like praising him for a second. I, I, let him lock you in, you see? 
Listen, I don't know what this year holds any more than you do. But one thing I know is who holds this year. Scream with me just a little bit. Hey! Man, we're going to have such a good time this year. Why? Because all we're doing is being strapped in. I want to remember this message. When March comes along and April comes along and September comes along and you're going through a little dark moment, just pull this message and say, Lord, this is just a part of the ride. One thing I like a roller coaster is after you've been in the dungeon for a while, the light comes so quickly. You go, shoot up. There are moments this year that you're going to come down laughing. You ever come in a roller coaster? You got to laugh on your way down. <laughs> All these different emotions. Just stay locked in. And sometimes when life gets rough, we want to jump out of the car. If you jump out, you get killed. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean to how you understand the machine. But in all your ways, just acknowledge he's in charge. And he will direct the roller coaster. He knows exactly where he wants to take you this year. Everybody say, take me Lord. And I tell you what, man. Something good is going to happen to you this year. I don't care how many bad things they put in your way. Something good is going to happen to you this year. One thing I like with roller coasters, though, you always end right where you start. You come right back with him standing there saying, how did you enjoy the ride? <laughs> Hallelujah. I can see it now. January 2005, God smiled and said, how did you enjoy that ride in 2004? And you're saying, well, that was pretty good, you know. I got the house you promised me. I got the car you promised me. I got the kids. I got my marriage you promised me. I got, you know, all the things he promised you in one year. Five years worth, he told me he's going to do this year. Come on, receive that right now. <laughs> Five years worth of blessing is coming in this one year in your life. Can you receive it, Brother Simon? There's no lies out of God's mouth. He will save you. He will save you. This verse here from the book of Jeremiah 15, it says, The Lord said, Surely I will deliver you for a good purpose. I can bring you out because I got a purpose I got to fix in your life. I will deliver you because of the purpose. Surely I will make your enemies plead with you in times of disaster and times of distress. They will what? Plead with you. When things are going the worst on your job, they come into you. Because you can be the only one with so much confidence. What is your secret will be their plea. How can you be so calm when the whole situation is not looking good? And your, your, your answer should be, because my future is his past. Amen. Do you know that God wrecked the economy of Egypt because of one young boy. That blows my mind. I said that blows my mind. I want I want to get this point across because some of you think you know. I mean, it, it is possible for the Bahamas to go through an economic disaster to make sure you succeed. Listen to me. Joseph was in jail. Jail was a part of the plan. Oh, have mercy. Because the man that he's supposed to meet, who's supposed to introduce him to the king, was in jail. Shaka Namurata. And your first response is, God... How did I end up in jail, God? Said, because your appointment is in jail. And some of your situations are jail. That job you feel locked and trapped in. God says, stay there. 
there's someone who's supposed to meet you here. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And God says, now, Joe, I want you to meet this baker and this cupbearer. Why? They are your connection, but they are in jail. And Joseph met them, and he, it was a private miracle. Sometimes God wants you to help people personally once. And that's all. And the Bible says when, they were, when the guy was released, he went back to his old job, serving the king. And it was this man who told the king, there is a young man in the jail who told me my dreams. And king, you need, you need a dream teller. I met this man in jail. <laughs> Sometime where you are is not comfortable. But you ain't there forever. You're there for an appointment. And he simply said, this man told me my dream. Now watch God. Before that was done, God set up the whole thing. God made sure that there was an economic crisis in Egypt. He shut down the whole economy. He bought a farming. The crops didn't grow. Nothing was going on. And the Pharaoh had this crazy dream about the thing was going to happen. Would God rearrange a whole country just for you? Absolutely, yes. Would God shake a whole company just for your promotion? Absolutely, yes. Would God cause there to be a downturn in the business sector just for your promotion? Absolutely, yes. He will fulfill his purpose for you. Write this down. The past is a portion of your future lived. That's all it is. That's why you shouldn't live in your past. Have a good trip back to school, young people. Enjoy this semester. Come back with 4.0. Amen. you going back to school. The past is dead. Everyone, please write this down. The past is dead except for the life you give it. 2003 is filled with regrets. Memories you don't want to think about. Failures that you can talk about. But you must remember to leave them there. We give life to history because we keep talking about it. We give life to history because we keep living it. We give life to history because we keep bringing it up over and over again. We give life to it. That's why God is the God. He works in such an interesting way. God says, look, bring me your sins. Then he says, I will forgive them. And then he says, I will forget them. I will throw them in the sea of forgetfulness. I won't even remember them anymore. In other words, the way God deals with your history is he doesn't remember it. And you got to learn to be like your father. Yes, you did some dumb things all through the past years or maybe even last year. Even to the end of the year, you might have done something dumb. But the moment you stepped over into this year, you're supposed to understand that the only life that thing has is what you keep giving it. You're forgiven. Number three, you cannot go to your future if you live in the past. I challenge you today to bury your history. Only use it for reference to make wiser decisions. But don't live in it. Number four, you cannot change the past if you could create a, if you create a new one. Let me tell you something. This is a very important point. I, I, I thought about this. 
you cannot do anything about your past. But you could actually create a new past. <laughs> Every day, you're creating a new past. So why don't you decide to create a past for the rest of your life that you'll enjoy? Remembering. The sooner you begin to create a good past and the right past, which is the purpose for God for your life, the more you will enjoy looking back. Oh, the Apostle Paul, what a man. Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind, I press. Because the future gives you hope. It makes the past have hope. There's a future by the take. But we got to shut down in a minute. Psalm chapter, Philippians chapter 3. Now this is an important verse. I quoted it before. I want to read this again. Watch this. It says, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus took hold of me. This is found in Philippians chapter 3. Now young people and older people, please remember this verse. This is the verse... In the list of three verses that changed my life as a teenager, this was one of them. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 changed my life. It says, now unto him who is able to do, etc. This verse was the next one that changed my life as a teenager. When I read this as a teenager, I said, this is what I want to be. This is when I discovered the principle of purpose here somewhere. It says, I forget what's behind and I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. I thought Christ took hold of me to go to heaven. This verse disagrees. It says, I press to take hold of that. <laughs> heaven is not a that. Heaven is a there. Christ took hold of me because of that. What that? That is the future that he hid inside of me. <laughs> oh, help me, Lord. Jesus wants to save you. Not because of heaven. He wants to salvage his investment. When I saw my son miming this morning, I said, wouldn't it be terrible if that was in a base house? Oh, you, good place to say amen, you missed it. If that young boy was on cocaine on the floor of a drug house, lost in the muck of destruction, we would not have been blessed by that mime dance this morning. Christ wasn't trying to get him to heaven when he saved him. He was trying to get that gift back. He took hold of you so you could take hold of that. Come on, read the Bible. He says, I'm going to save you so you could do that. There's something I need you to do so I save you so you could do that the other verse is important it says brethren I do not therefore consider myself yet to have taken hold of it where's your future it's trapped inside of you I have not arrived Paul says I'm born again full of the Holy Spirit I speak in tongues but I still haven't done yet that which means that salvation is not about heaven. It's about earth and about you doing what you came here to do. This year is another year for you to bring out more of that. Tell your neighbor, I want to see some of you that. Say it loud. Tell them again. I want to see some of your that. 
whatever that is, I want to see more of that. You are full of that. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you are full of that. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, Lord, reveal my that. He took hold of me so I could take hold of that. And I've not released it yet, Paul says. Look at the next verse. Oh, he said, but this one thing I have decided to do. Read it with me. Forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead. I press toward the goal to win the prize for, the, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press to take hold of that. God sent Christ from heaven not to take me to heaven but to reveal what heaven placed in earth in me. Amen. Amen. Everybody say forget. Yeah. Come on, say forget. Yeah. Boy, it's hard to forget sometimes. People hurt you, people do things to you, people say things to you that hurt you. You can carry an offense from 2003, 2004. You carry all kinds of burdens from 2003, 2004. And you, you carry these things over. Listen, this is the last week you got to drop it. Drop it now. Get back in the race and say, Lord, I want to take hold of that. I don't have time in 2004 for 2003 offenses. No time. I ain't got time for failures that I did last year to drag them over into this year. That's a dumb move. Forgetting what is behind. Everybody say strain. You know why you got a strain? Because the past pulling You got to fight to get rid of your past. You got to fight. The devil wants to use your history to suffocate your future. I'll have none of it. I don't know about you, but I'll have none of it, devil. I'll have none of it. Listen. This list, please. I isolated these because I wanted you to see what causes people to lose their confidence. What is the fear of facing the future? Here's where fear comes from. Number one, lack of knowledge. We are afraid of what we don't know. Number two, fear comes from uncertainty. We are afraid of what we're not sure of. Number three, fear comes from the unknown. We are afraid of the fact that we're not aware of what might happen this year. So we live in fear. Number four, Past failures cause fear. We keep remembering what we failed in, and so we're afraid to try it again in this year. Past failure. I wonder if there's such a thing as failure to God. I don't think failure is in God's vocabulary. I believe there's disobedience or there's lack of timing. Wrong timing. Because Moses tried to set the people free by himself with a piece of wood. Did he? Yes, and he killed the guy. In other words, his plan was to kill them one at a time. <laughs> Are you listening to me? In other words, some of us know God's purpose, but the timing ain't right, and so we think we failed. So he tried to, to set people free one at a time. He started killing one at a time. He killed one, boom, put him in the sand. Next. I mean, imagine trying to kill, you know, three, four million Egyptians or whatever. That's a long life at work. So God said, tell you what, Moses, the time man is off. So Moses fled. And some of you may be in that position. I've been there many times. I backed off from things that God told me to do because I felt this ain't working. This can't be God. And God said, no, the timing wasn't right. The purpose is the same. It's still good, but the timing is off. 
And so 40 years later, God meets Moses, and God tells Moses the exact same thing, to do the same thing he wanted to do, and he told him to use the same thing that he had, a piece of wood. Now watch this, God said, Mo, I want you to go and set the Israelites free. Mo said, I tried that before. Now I'm a fugitive, and they're looking for me. God said, I want you to use that piece of wood. I said, I tried the wood thing too. The wood thing is what got me in trouble. I watched God. In other words, the business that you started last year that didn't work, <laughs> you figure, that was the devil. I miss God. No, you didn't miss God. You missed the year. Oh, come on, shout praise the Lord. <laughs> when the time is right, Glory, hallelujah. What you was working so hard to do the last five years, God will do it in one year. Moses, Moses went back after God convinced him. Mo, I'm with you now because the time is right. Moses stood there with one piece of stick and a whole army of Egyptians. And with one way, they were dead. Now, you can work hard and kill one at a time and bury all in the sand, or you can just stand there with one way, everybody drowned. What's the difference between killing and burying one at a time and just years? Go ahead, clap. Go face the clap. Yes. I prophesy for some of you, 2004 has been waiting on you. This is your year. This is the year. All the toil you've been through for the last five years, God's going to culminate them in one 12 month period. Hallelujah. It's going to happen so easily. You're going to know it was the year. Let your hands and thank God receive that right now. I don't know about you, but you got to receive that. Praise God. Receive that. Hallelujah. I receive it. God says your past failures should not give you fear. Because they passed. You didn't fail. You were just off time. Or sometimes you were off people. <laughs> It's incredible. You mix with the wrong people, they mess you up for a whole year. Number five, negative experiences causes fear. Number six, dependency on self can cause you to fear. When you look at what you got to do in your life and you try to figure out how you're going to do it, that's enough to frighten anybody. You ain't smart enough, you ain't rich enough, and you ain't cool enough. You, 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 you can't do this thing. So don't depend on yourself. Number seven, dependency on your own resources. That brings fear. You look at what you want to do and look at how much you have, you back off. Number eight, peer pressure can cause you to bring fear to your life. You, you stick with the wrong people and they talk you out of everything that you believe in God to do. And peer pressure works another way too. Some people who you want approval from, instead of you moving to what you want to do, you stay with them. In other words, the power of acceptance can prevent your future. You want to be accepted. Number nine, very important, social conformity. And this is what I'm talking about. We are afraid sometimes to proceed to the vision and the future of our lives because we try to be socially conformed. And there are people who say to you, well, you know, you can't do that. Uh, you know, no one has ever done that from our family. Why don't you be like your other brothers and sisters? Be nothing. That's what they tell you. And then here another one. Who do you think you are? That's social conformity. Your family got you figured out. All of you are supposed to be the same. That's what they told you. 
Why are you trying to be different? The answer should be what? Because I am different. But that's a powerful pressure to break. Some of you came to this ministry at an expense of friendships and family. And they still worried about you. Social conformity. They don't want you to go to your dream. You become like those who you keep company with. This is an issue I keep saying. That's why I keep in company with big-minded people, with big dreams. I'm doing it. You know, they sent an invitation out. I'm going to let you know so y'all can pray for me. But uh, on Tuesday, I am leaving to go to Orlando. Matter of fact, tonight I'll be in Orlando speaking for Morris Cirillo. And that's going to be broadcast all over the world. So please pray for me. I'm the main speaker tonight in Orlando. But on Tuesday, I've been invited along with just a few leaders, Jack Hayford and Joyce Myers and Kenny Copeland and some people. They invited a few, few of us, and they wanted us to spend just a few days locked up in a room. And they said, we want you, because you are one of the leaders who we believe God wants to speak to us through. I said, why me? I don't, I'm not even American. They said, we want you. God told us that we must have you in the meeting. So we're going to be locked up in the meeting for the next two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. And they want to get the mind of God about the future of the church. Now listen, I don't mind keeping coming to these people, you know, because I can learn from them. And I'm going to, 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 to pick up the anointings that they got. And I want to listen to how big they're thinking. See, some of you are bad company for me because you're following me. <laughs> now, I'm going to say this respectfully now. See, if I sit with you, you can't see beyond what I can see. And so if I listen to you, I go back sometime. My job is to help you. Let's go forward. So I got I to gotta keep coming with people who are already forward. And they're going forward so that I can also bring you. And wherever I go, i taking you. You go with me. We go into the big time. We're going to change the world for God. But you got to watch your company. Social conformity. Some people I cannot be with. There are some pastors in the city I cannot be friends with. I love them, but I cannot hang out. Why? Because their thoughts are so small. Jesus told the disciples, be careful of the leaven of the religious leaders. You know what leaven does? It's, it's yeast. It infects you. One of the well-known pastors in this country came to see me two weeks ago. Made an appointment. Came to my office, sat down two weeks ago. Very well-known guy. And he said to me, he said, Pastor Miles, it took me a long time to come to you. But I realize I need you. I'm tired of the company I'm keeping. I want to keep company with somebody who can take me forward, he says. Your association does determine your destination. You know, Pastor Neely last night, I, I was so blessed by him last night. Pastor Theo Neely was honored last night. I was invited to speak there as well. And he and I and uh, Honorable Hubert, Hubert Ingram, the former Prime Minister, were, were talking. And we were chatting about a couple of things. And I heard him say last night something that really touched me. He said, you know, Pastor Miles, I was in Andrus all those years, but when I heard about Bahamas Faith Ministries, 1984, Everybody said you was a cult. He said, but my wife and I prayed and the Lord told us, if you want to go somewhere, hook up with that young man. He said it cost him his denomination. Because he invited us to South Andrews to do a conference in his church. And they told him, you're out, you can't do this. It's a cult. 
He said he's so glad he did that. If you want to be an eagle, you don't keep coming with pigeons. Now, pigeons flock. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Pigeons flock. They're always in big groups. But eagles, you find them one at a time. You got to look for people who are flying high. You got to go look. They don't just show up. You got to go after them. Got to go after them. This year, make a decision that you are going to dig in, put your roots down, and you're going to take this ride with God to the top of your dream and bring up more of your future. This is the will of God. Write this last two, this last one down. The need for acceptance causes fear of, 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 of progress. Wanting people to like you can keep you back. Hallelujah. And that's why we got to be careful who we pattern ourselves after. Because there are people who ain't going nowhere and they want you to go with them. You remember that? Don't forget it. And there's some folks who ain't doing nothing and they want you to do it with them. I think the first thing you should do when you meet somebody is say, hello, what's your name? And then next question, what you doing? Uh, in other words, let me decide how long I can stay with you. <laughs> next question, where are you going? And don't say to the store because I'm gone after that. Eh? <laughs> and I don't know where you're going. Your future is too precious to be retarded by people who ain't got none. I told my wife this year, I said, this year, I'm going to live so hard, they're going to think there's three of me. I don't know about you. I made my resolution. I said, this year, I'm going to do so much in one year, they're going to think I lived five years. How about you? I said, how about you? <laughs> I made a decision. I'm wasting time with nobody who's going to hinder me. I'm telling you now. I'm too old to keep bad company. Oh, shout amen, somebody. <laughs> Am I right about that? Hey, I, hey, listen, as soon as you pass 30, you better start choosing who you hanging out with. Because you ain't got no time to go to school no more. You, you got to live now. I'm meeting all kinds of people. i like, sizing them up fast. Sizing them up. Let me see if I want to be with you. Why? I grow an old man. I got no time to sit around discussing, fussing, arguing. I mean, and these distractions in your life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The need to be accepted.